Hello, my name is Kalman Reti, and I'm going to show you a Lisp machine emulator running on my Acer laptop. This laptop normally boots into Windows, but it's booted into a live DVD that has an Ubuntu Linux system on it with the Genera software all preloaded. And as you can see, we are booted into the emulated Lisp machine. It booted much faster than any real live uh, hardware list machine ever did. I'm going to log in so that I can actually load a file from a real live hardware list machine. This is over the network. Uh, in fact, this is a file server that's a real live ivory machine at MIT. And I'm going to, uh, this is a, a, an editor buffer that's a lot like Emacs. Uh, we call it Cmacs. Um, it's a predecessor to the GNU Emacs, but um, a successor to the earlier versions of Emacs that were around at the MIT AI lab. Um, what I want to do is I want to compile these functions because uh, they're uh, useful for my demonstration. I'm going to say meta x, and notice I have a prompt down here. I'm going to type c o m space. Now, notice it partially completed. It uh, capitalized the c and, and added the p, but there are commands that start with compare, and there's commands that start with compile, and it doesn't know enough yet to complete fully, but I type b space, it now knows that the only combinations of the first bits and the last bits that I typed uh, are for compile buffer, so now I can uniquely uh, complete the command, and I hit return to issue it. So. Here I go back to the Lisp listener. This is a redevelop print loop in modern terminology, but it's unusual in that not only does it allow you to type expressions like one, two, three. Notice I'm going to type just the closed parentheses, and it's going to immediately finish the expression and evaluate it. Um, this is slightly easier to see if I do an, uh, an expression like this, where notice I type the closed parentheses and I immediately get the HI printed right after the closed parentheses. The reason there was a, a, a new line before printing the 6 in the previous one is that um, the command loop, uh, the read if all print loop, takes the answer from the evaluation, produces a new line, prints it, and then produces a new line and a new prompt. So it surrounds them in white space. But uh, it because my uh, second form that I evaluated did not have any new line, it didn't, didn't generate any. Um, but we can also issue commands. So I can, uh, as, as this little uh, you know, blurb up here on the screen uh, tells me, uh, I can type help commands to dis display a list of help processor commands. So I'm going to type help. I type HEL space commands. Uh, I just type COM space. And I can hit return, and it tells me that I'm in the user command table, and it has 30 commands of its own, and it also inherits additional commands from these other command tables. And as I move around, notice these things are mouse sensitive. The reason they're mouse sensitive is that on the list machine, instead of just printing something as taking the structure that's the object uh, or objects that you're printing and generating a, a single st sequence of characters. We do that, but we also keep the connection between that and the original underlying object. So when I'm sitting here at the compram prompt wanting a command, I can have presentation to command translators would take the presentations of objects that I've already printed on my TypeScript and convert them into you know reasonable commands. So for example, if I go and um, hover over this McIvory support, which is a name of a system that's been loaded into this world, the black area down at the bottom shows that MetaMouse middle would issue the command show system definition McIvory support. If I go over here, and you know, this is a different object that was presented, um, I now see that MetaMouse left will show this particular file, which is a patch that got loaded. And if I go over this images, um, you know, output from the my previous help commands command, uh, I see that this would show all the commands, or if I did a, with the, if I click left, or uh, will describe the command table if I do a, a click right. So I'm going to click left, and we'll see that in this images command table, I've got five commands, and I can is issue one of those by s just by clicking on it. 
and let me get the file that I want. Now, um, if you're in the middle of a command, you can type control slash to see what the possibilities of completion are. Now, in this particular case, I was um, specifying a path name, and this is the first one I have, so I have to actually log in with my credentials before I get to see it. But it finished after I gave those credentials and listed all the files. And indeed, this is the file I want. I just click on it and hit return, and I'm off loading it. Notice down here, we have a thing that says we're running. There's a little bar underneath that's showing that the CPU is in use. We have the file name that's running, and we have an updating total of how many bytes in that file we are. Um, this part over here is the uh, package that we're currently in. This is the user I logged in as, and this is an updating clock. Um, so here we are. Um, notice there was another image. I can say show this image by clicking on it, and then now none of these things that were mouse sensitive before are mouse sensitive now, because what we are in the context of wanting is an image, not a file name, not a um, system name, not a command name. So I click on the name of an image, and indeed it shows me the image. Now the, the software that I was using has a bug, as you can see. Uh, it got the decoding at, at the end wrong. So, luckily, I have a special variable in this world, which uh, lets me control whether I use that software or some different software. This is uh, whether I'm using the independent JPEG group's um, C implementation of a JPEG decoder. So I can control meta y to yanking the previous command, and then meta y to go backwards to previous ones. I can just redo the read image file command. I could have also scrolled backwards and clicked on it in the TypeScript. That would have been another way to re-invoke it. And now notice there's some slightly different output. And the reason is that now we're executing C code. Um, I'm going to go and show you that we are indeed executing C code by breaking into the dynamic listener into the debugger. And notice we see a stack frame that's showing you a C function and C variables. And the little prompt is a little C inside of a legend. So that w that shows us that we are inside of a C function. But you know, um, there's Lisp around here too. This is the very topmost thing. This called that, which called this, etc. These are all Lisp functions until we get to here. This um, read JPEG stream Lisp function called the C system execute function to execute a C function, um, which has an internal Lisp function, which finally gets around to actually executing a C function. Read JFIF to IMAM, which then gal calls this C function read JPEG file, which is part of the independent JPEG groups. This is a, a, an interface um, function that I wrote, etc. Uh, one of the features of the Lisp machine debugger is I can say control X, contro control X E, which means set trap on exit, and then I can uh, just proceed without any special action um, and go back. got a notification saying that the, a window was waiting for something to happen. And indeed, what happened is that we got around to the um, exit from that stack frame. Um, and I can just continue to exit. Uh, a lot of times, you, you can break into the debugger in any, any function that's running on the list machine. But oftentimes, you know, that might be an inconvenient place. Let's say you're holding a lock that the, the system needs. And so there's a limited amount of stuff you can do. So you can move up the stack frame, say, um, s you know, re-enter the debugger when you get to exit this stack frame. And then now you can be outside of the context of that lock and, and do things. Um, inside the stack, uh, in the debugger, you can evaluate expressions using the local variable names and values that are uh, current for this particular stack frame. Um, I'll show more of that later, but I really just want to demonstrate another thing that's uh, unique about the list machine. So now, um, uh, this is again the name. If I click right, I get this um, operations menu that I can do, that in, in, and one of them is, is just invoke show image on it. And that's another way to issue the command. And notice you'll see that the, uh, 
the bottom isn't misdecoded. So this particular way of decoding JPEG files is um, is you know, bug-free, or maybe has fewer bugs. In any case, the the thing I wanted to show you is the uh, function that's in my file called part, and this is a uh, you know one of these try this on your Lisp uh, things. Uh, Lisp machines, uh, common Lisp allows you to have indirect arrays, which point into some other array and share the data. But um, what they don't allow you to do is to have 2D subsets of 2D arrays, uh, but the Lisp machine does. So what we're doing here is we're finding the image with the name, and we're sending that object, which is a you know an image object, a data array message, which will give us back a, a raster array, a 2D array. And then we're going to make a new image uh, of type color 32-bit image with this name and uh, a width and a height of just 200 pixels. And its data array, this new uh, image's data array, will be a raster array that's 200 by 200 that has the appropriate type. And it's displaced to the original one, the big one. However, it's displaced conformally. That means that. Uh, not only do we displace to a starting point, but we displace in such a way that the stride comes out correctly so that it actually is a 2D uh, subset. And then, of course, we have to say how far in we were displacing. And so we're basically getting what would be the index of the 300 by 560 point as the starting point of our displacement. So let me run this. And notice I get back an image. I can show that image. And you can see that, indeed, I have a, a nice 200 by 200 you know, slice of that. Uh, so, so what good is that? Well, I, you know, I can uh, show source, sorry, code redline of another function. And what this function is going to do is it's going to find the image name part and get its data array. And then for i from 0 to 199, it's going to set the pixel ii to the input value, which in this particular case happens to be red, which is why it's called redline. So I'm going to call redline. Now, what we've done is we've bashed those pixels in the array. This is a this air array that shares data between the two parts. And But nothing happened on screen. That's because um, the already displayed presentation you know, the pixels that are on the screen are cached. But if I do function refresh to update, and uh, that happens to not work with the keystrokes I did because I forgot to do something. Now let's do function refresh. Notice I got the, uh, the red line. This is what we just drew by this function. But if I scroll backward to see the, the big picture, you can see that it was also there because those are really the same data points. So I hope this whets your appetite. I'm planning to do a, a bunch of uh, little demonstrations along these same veins, uh, pointing out uh, various different unique features of the Lisp machine. So have a nice day. Bye.